I wonder about how you guys are going when we're going through the book of Isaiah and um, always interested to see what's going to come out of uh, the next chapter because basically what I'm doing every week is um, I don't really know until I sit down and study it but I'm really just going through all the messianic scriptures and the scriptures in Isaiah that actually talk about Jesus and then just see what the Lord wants to bring from that. So um, it's exciting because we're doing things around the other way rather than looking at the New Testament and seeing the quotes from Isaiah. We're starting from Isaiah and then seeing the fulfillment in the New Testament. So um, it's pretty exciting. Last time we were in chapter 35 and we talked about the miracles of Jesus and um, my basically the I said the RSV which is the, the Rob Stuttle version of um, Isaiah 35, 3 to 4 is, Be strong, stand tall, don't let fear grip your heart. God will cause to fall those who are trying to make you fall. He is against your adversary and he will repay you for any hurt or damage that, uh, that has been caused. He will constantly save you. And then when we got down to verse 5, we can be confident and not live in fear because the same Jesus who created the universe... The same Jesus who did all the miracles in the New Testament dwells in you and me by the Holy Spirit. And the wonderful thing about the, the miracles of Jesus, they were not done in his divinity, they were done in his humanity by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's why Jesus said, greater things shall you do in my name. And then we talked about this is a great way to engage with people in the world who are full of fear and scared of um, getting the virus or getting harm from the vaccine, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus heals. Amen? And um, a way that that can connect. And then we looked at the whole chapter and saw about the, the future glory of Zion. So this week we're in Isaiah 40. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the riches of your word, Lord. We just thank you that it's nourishment to us. And Lord, I thank you that, uh, Holy Spirit, you are the teacher and that you know where everybody is at today and, and the, where they are in their lives and their needs. And I just pray that your word will speak to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I'm going to preach about John the Baptist today. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard any messages on John the Baptist, but Jesus had a lot to say about John the Baptist, and he was the forerunner of Christ. And easy way to find about John the Baptist, because it's in Mark 1 and John 1, and it's also in Luke 3 and Matthew 3. So it's easy to, to find in those chapters. So you can find it there. You can find it in the movie Godspell. Remember that song? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. <laughs> and did you know John had a middle name? It's the. John the Baptist. <laughs> Beware, there's going to be a few bad dad jokes today. Now, um, so he, the prophecy that was fulfilled in John the Baptist in this scripture is also about us and also about what's yet to be revealed. And um, one of the things I've been learning lately is that, you know, prophecy in the Greek mind, which is where we get a lot of our thinking from, is prophecy and fulfillment. But in the Jewish mind, prophecy is pattern. So what has been prophesied um, has happened and we will happen again. Amen? You see that throughout the Bible. You see constantly that there are things that are prophesied and then they happen and then they actually happen again or they might be talking about a person but then it actually is fulfilled in someone else. That's the Jewish idea of prophecy and so we see this in in the scripture because the scripture is talking about John the Baptist but it's also talking about us, about us preparing the way for the Lord. Amen? But it's also talking about 
um, the future because it says the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. The mouth of the Lord is spoken. So we know the glory of the Lord was revealed in Jesus, but also his glory will be revealed when he comes in his second coming to rule and reign on this earth. Amen? And so that's the Jewish mind of prophecy is pattern, is that what has happened will, will happen again and may happen again. And so it's good to keep that in mind. So, so John, when John the Baptist came, he actually fulfilled this scripture. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So we're, we're going to have a look at some of the scriptures about um, John the Baptist. And uh, some things you'll know, some things might be um, new to you. So let's go to John 1, verses 19 to 36. John chapter 1, 19 to 36. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Israel to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. He said, Are you a prophet? And he answered, No. And then they said to him, Well, who are you? That you may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So he saw that he was the fulfillment of what Isaiah had actually prophesied. Now, now those who were sent from the Pharisees, um, and they asked him, saying, well, why then do you baptise if you're not the Christ or Elijah or a prophet? And John answered them and said, I baptise with water, but there stands one who is among me, who you do not know. It is, he who, it is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptising. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is he whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, and for he was before me. And I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remaining upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Holy um, Spirit, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And again the next day John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked said, Behold the Lamb of God. I'm just going to pick a few things out of um, this passage of scripture. Because there's a couple of phrases that actually repeat themselves. And when something is in the word of God more than once, the Holy Spirit's trying to get your attention. Um, so let's, let's let the Holy Spirit get our attention on something. There's a really interesting passage in here and it says in verse 27, It is he who coming after me is preferred before me. Now, I believe that Isaiah had an amazing revelation that Jesus lived outside of time. Because look at what he says. He says, in verse 27, he says, It is he coming after me who is preferred before me. And then in verse 30, he says this, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, because he was before me. <laughs> Interesting thing, isn't it? Basically, he's saying, now, now scholars will tell you based on um, the, the birth of Jesus and the birth of um, John, that John was about six to eight months old when Jesus was born, okay? And we know that from the account when Mary went to Elizabeth and she was already pregnant and all those things. That, so John came before Jesus. Jesus came after John, right? Also, John went out and into the wilderness and Jesus you know, started his ministry after John's ministry. But then John says, he came after me, but he was actually before me. <laughs> now, if you're not sure, I want, I want to show you something. Um, the word preferred in the Greek is the word genomai, and this is what that word means. To come into existence, to begin to be, appeared in history and came upon the stage. <laughs> so when John is saying 
this, because it's a strange thing to say, it's, he's preferred before me. What he's saying is that he came into existence before me. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But he knows that wasn't true as far as physically when Jesus came on this earth because he was born six to eight months later. What he was saying is that the one who comes after me always existed. He is the pre-existing one. He is the one that appeared in history well before. So they knew the Messiah, they knew about the angel of the Lord. He knew that this Jesus was the Jesus who created the earth. He knew that this Jesus was, well, was around well before he was, and he said, he come, you know, I'm coming before, before him, but he was actually before me. Isn't that amazing? He had that revelation. You know, a lot of people in those days would not have understood that. A lot of people today don't even understand that. But John had the revelation who this Jesus Christ was. He was the maker of the universe. He was the pre-existing one. He was the one who was all, you know, there before even earth began. And now I've come before him to prepare the way, but he was always there before me. Isn't that amazing? What amazing thing, that revelation. And then um, there's another phrase that's repeated, and uh, this is what Sue was talking about this morning. Uh, in verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then verse 36, he says, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God. That was a major shift in theology. That was a major shift in the whole sacrificial system. Because when you brought a lamb, it wasn't the Lamb of God, it was your lamb. <laughs> You raised the lamb. You made sure it was unblemished. You brought it through the camp. Everybody knew that you'd sinned because you were bringing in your lamb to, to there. And the priest would have lambs as well. But this was not the lamb that a priest presented to God. This was not the lamb that the sinner brought to the priest to transfer their sins onto them and to be sacrificed. This was God's lamb. Isn't that amazing? To say, behold the lamb of God. Behold this man, God has sent to be the sacrifice for the human race. This is God's lamb. That was huge, a huge statement. And then not only that, he said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was a huge statement. That was a, that was a defining statement to say those words. Because no longer... Was there an atonement for sins? This is what Sue was talking about. The priest would go once a year. Only one person was allowed to go in. And if he wasn't acceptable to God, God would strike him down and they'd have to drag him out with that cord. But all that did was atone for their sin. All that did was cover their sin for one year and then they started again. And Paul, and here's John came along, and he's not saying the Lamb of God that atones for sin. He's saying the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's a, that was a huge defining statement. Um, Hebrews 10, 11 to 14 says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. <laughs> It was about sin consciousness. Every day, daily, they were doing these sacrifices you know, to be acceptable to God, but it never took away sins. Verse 12, But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God from the time waiting until his enemies had made his footstool. Still, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. One of my favourite passages in the whole Bible. Because Jesus, it says, this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. So when, when John said, I'm preparing the way of the Lord because this man is coming, he's actually going to sacrifice, he is going to take away sins, there'll be no more need for atonement, there'll be no more need for a sacrificial system. That was a huge statement. A huge statement. The, fr the phrase, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, is the most pivotal in all of Scripture. It signified a crossing over, a crossing over from law to grace, a crossing over from the sacrificial system to Jesus, the sacrificial Lamb. 
a crossing over from continual sacrifices to one sacrifice for all. And this took place in a place called Bethabara. Now that word in Hebrews means the house of Ford. Do you know what a Ford is? It's a place where you cross over. <laughs> it was actually by the Jordan and it was a place where they crossed over the Jordan. And so the very name of the place mean a crossing over place. Isn't that amazing? I love how the Holy Spirit does that. I really do. You know, if you take the time to search it out, you'll see that the Holy Spirit just puts these little gems and they're not there by mistake. The place where John was actually saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the whole crossing over from, you know, the sacrificial system from law to grace happened in a place that was a crossing over of the Jordan. Isn't that amazing? I just... I just think, wow, <laughs> hallelujah. I just love how the Holy Spirit does that. Okay, Matthew chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region around Jordan went out to him and were baptised by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. You could easily skip this over. But in verse 5 it says, Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region around Jordan went out to him. <laughs> he didn't have to be an itinerant minister. He didn't actually have to have incentives to get people to come. In fact, he was preaching a sinner's baptism and, a, and, a, and repentance. He was telling them that, you know, they're doing the wrong thing, they need to come. And people were coming out in their droves. They were coming from the hills, they were coming from the region. They were actually coming to him to actually have their, you know, to be baptised and to have their, you know, the remission of sins and to repent. Now, if that was done then, imagine what um, grace can do. Amen? Imagine what a revival of grace can do. I believe that we're going to see this again, where people are going to come. Now, there's a, reason, there's a reason for that, and we'll get into that in a moment. Jesus, Jesus talks about it. But this, there were, he, drew a, he drew a crowd even though he preached repentance and a sinner's baptism. And then Matthew 3, uh, verses 13 to 15. I'm just, I'm just pulling some um, things out about, about John the Baptist through different passages in um, you know, Matthew, John. And, and so um, Matthew 3.13, it says, Jesus came from Galilee to, to John at the Jordan to be baptised by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, yet you're coming to me. Now I can imagine John would have been totally confused. <laughs> you know, here's Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the pre-existing one, the, the, the prophet that they've been looking for. He was the fulfilment. He was the Messiah. And then he comes to John, who's doing a sinner's baptism, a baptism of repentance, and says, I want you to baptise me. And, um, and John tried to prevent him. He said, no, that's not right. How can that be? You know, how can it be that you want to come and be a, in a sinner's baptism? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. You see, Jesus was preparing to truly be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen? And the thing was, is that those who believe in him would be made righteous. And so it was a, a significance, it was a symbol that he, was, he wasn't going into the waters of baptism for his own sin. He was actually going into the waters of baptism for the sins of the world. Amen? Because John was the one who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was signifying that he'd actually come to take away the sins of the world. It was symbolic. And it's interesting Jesus' response because he says, It is fulfilling to fulfill all righteousness because in him take away the sins of the world not only did he take away the, the sins of the world but he gave us his righteousness that was fulfilling of righteousness amen and so John got it yeah first he said no then when he understood it he allowed it um, okay 1 John 6 3 we're going to now talk about some of the things that Jesus said about John 
And so uh, in John 1, um, 6 to 13, um, this, is, this is Jesus talking. He says, There was a man sent from God whose name was, was John. Um, John means grace, by the way, <laughs> and if you didn't know that. And so um, here, here, here John was a crossing over from law to grace. His actually name means grace. Um, so this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So there was a man whose name was John. John means grace. Verse 7, he was to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He came to bear witness. That's what we're meant to do. Amen. That's the fulfillment for us of this scripture. We, we are light bearers coming to bear witness of the true light. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, these days so many people believe they have the light, you know, but it's not the true light. Amen. <laughs> they might be illuminated, but it doesn't mean that they have the true light. Um, one of the interesting things about um, Noah's Ark, and so much you can study about Noah's Ark, is to do with Jesus. But there, the only windows in the Ark were actually up above. And so the, the only place the light came through was up, up above. It actually talks about the true light, not false light. And so G, John came to witness to the true life. That's what we're meant to do. Amen? I, I have no problem talking with New Age people and stuff like that because they, they, they have a concept of... Um, you know, things are spiritual, they're just not following the true light. That's, that's the difference. And so my, my role then is, you know, and I find it easy to talk to them more than, say, an atheist because an atheist doesn't even believe God exists. At least they, you know, have some concept of spirituality and when they start talking about it, that, then I feel free to talk about my spirituality and I talk about the Holy Spirit and, you know, we, we actually had a, uh, a lady who uh, actually was one of the teachers at the school and um, we were here doing a fundraiser for the school and Brenda invited her to, to come in and she said, oh, she said, it's um, oh, this amazing presence and she said, it's so light. She said, I've been in other churches and it, they seem dark and dingy but this church seems so light and there's just and something about it and she said, we call that the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And even, even talking to her later, in the, we, we have a funny thing, she calls me Father Rob, I call her Sister Tracy. But um, we, uh, you know, she, she still was impacted by, you know, the presence of God. You know, I've, I've had that before. I had a, 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 a wedding here one time and a, and a uh, lady was from an events place who was setting it all up. And as she was packing down, she said, oh, there's just a, you know... Um, amazing um, vibe. She called it a vibe. She said, oh, there's an amazing vibe here. I said, yeah, we call that the Holy Spirit. We call that the presence of God. <laughs> I said, because this is a church. It's not just a chapel building. You know, it's a church and the presence of God is here. And so, you know, it's, when, when people sort of understand about light, you can lead them to the true light. Amen? You can lead them to the, the real thing. <laughs> and so... He wasn't the light, but he, was, he, was a, he bore witness to the light. Um, verse 9, it says, um, The true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Isn't that amazing? It's, um, verse 9 says, That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So Jesus gives light to every single person. You know, no one... People don't realise who are walking around. They wouldn't even exist without Jesus. You know, they wouldn't be able to breathe without Jesus. They just don't know him. They don't, because it goes on to say that um, um, he came, yeah, he, the world didn't know him and he came to his own and they didn't know him. So, um, and it, it, actually before that it says he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world didn't know him. <laughs> and so here's, here's John going, Jesus made you, he created everything, he is the light that's actually come to you, 
You need to get to know him. He was preparing the way. That's how we're meant to be. Amen? Because it shows that actually it says the world didn't know him and his, his own didn't receive him, which is Jew and Gentile. The world didn't know him, but also it says he, he also came to his own and his own didn't receive him. He actually brackets those two. He shows that he came to the Gentiles, they didn't know him. He came to his own, the Jew, but they didn't receive him. Isn't that interesting? So we are to be the light bearers. Um, Revelation 1 verses 12 to 13 says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded around his chest with a golden band. So the Son of Man walks amongst the lampstands. Verse 20 tells you what they are. The mystery of the seven stars which were in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So you are the church, amen? That means you're a lampstand, you're a light, you're a candle. You're actually burning for Jesus and he is walking amongst it. You are bearing that light. That's what we're meant to be. The reason why... Um, God chose a nation, which was Israel, was to actually be a light, to actually show them that there is a God and, and that he is displayed through that nation. We, as a church, as the people of God, same thing. That doesn't mean we've taken over from Israel. God has a plan for Israel, but also a plan for the church. He sent his son and that he dwells in us and we actually are meant to burn bright. Amen? And so you are the lampstand. You are the candle. You are the one that burns bright and Jesus walks amongst us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Because Matthew 5, 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city which is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Isn't that interesting? Here it is again, that candle. And it gives light to those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen? And that, that doesn't talk about let your light shine where you're at church. It's talking about your whole life shining for Jesus all the time because people are looking at you. People are looking for the true light. Everyone around this area is looking for the true light. <laughs> and you've got it. <laughs> how are they going to see it? They're going to see you walking. They're going to see how you act, how you react in these times. They're going to see that... Uh, you know, when they're sick, you lay hands on the sick and they recover. They're going to see something different about you. Amen? And then they're going, to, they're going to find the light that you bear in Jesus' name. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, uh, John 5, 32. Are you with me today? <laughs> cool. Okay, John 5, 32 to 36. This is Jesus' words about John the Baptist. He said, there's another who bears witness of me. I know that witness which he wit witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. He's talking to the Pharisees, but he's talking about John the Baptist. And then he says, Yet I do not, re I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be, be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light, but I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do. Bear witness of me, and the Father has sent me. In other words, he's saying there was, John was there, John was bearing witness of me. He said, I don't need a testimony of man, but he was bearing witness of me, but I have someone who bears even greater witness, and that's the Father. Amen? Who comes. Now, let's look at that. So, three things about this. John, he was a light. Now, if you look at that word in the Greek, it's actually the word uh, lekainos, which means a lamp, a candle that is placed on a stand or a candlestick. <laughs> that's who John was. Isn't that amazing? Because that's the light that John was, and it's the same light that's talked about in Revelation, about being a, a light, part of, the, part of the menorah, and actually that Jesus walks as a part of that. So he was a light. He was also a burning light because Jesus said he was the burning and shining light or shining lamp. 
So he was a burning light. It denotes sincerity, zeal, and fervent, fervency. There's a famous quote from John Wesley. It says, light yourself on fire with passion, and people will come from miles to watch you burn. You ever heard that quote? Anyone heard that quote before? Another thing is, if, you, if there's a house on fire, everyone will come out to watch it burn. And that's why people came to John, because they watched him burn. They watched him zealous for God. He, he was there to prepare the way for the Lord. What an amazing thing. He was sent to prepare for the way for the Lord. Then he met the very person that he was preparing the way from, for. And then he said, well, he was here well before I was. He was always here. And so, you know, if you, if, uh, you know, just keep burning for Jesus. Amen. Um, that's the wonderful thing is that if you used to consist, consistently stay burning for Jesus, the Holy Spirit will bring in your path those who need to hear it and just don't shy away from it when the time comes. And so he was a burning light, he was a shining light. You know, here's the thing about a shining light a shining light burns brighter in the darkness. Amen? You know, these lights don't seem to emit much light, but I tell you what, when this, this is dark, those lights shine brighter than they are now. Um, the other night, our, our, little, um, our little grandson, Zed, we, we bought him these Spider-Man shoes, but they had lights in them, and so when you walk, the little lights went off on the side. And, and it looked cool, but, you know, we went next door and had dinner. I couldn't wait till it got dark so I could really see what it looked like. And, and I was still there, and he was down here, and I could see those lights going off. <laughs> see... Where to shine the light for Jesus, but guess what? The darker it gets, the lighter you, 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 you shine. And it's not that you're doing anything different. It's actually the darkness that is actually showing your light off even more. Amen? And so don't worry about the darkness that's around, and don't worry that it's going to get darker, because all it's going to do is make your light shine brighter. Amen? <laughs> okay. Now, this, this is... Uh, the, this is an interesting statement that Jesus made. Matthew 11, 11 to 15. These are more words from Jesus about John the Baptist. He said, Surely I say to you, among those born of women, there was not one risen or one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom is greater than, than he. So that's a, a little bit of an oxymoron because he says there's no one greater, but he who's least in the kingdom is greater. And then it says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you are willing to receive it, he is the Elijah who is to come, he who has ears, let him hear. So why did Jesus say that about John the Baptist? Why did he say that there is not one um, born of women who has um, risen greater than John the Baptist? Well, a few things. One, because he was the forerunner to Christ. You know, there was a, he broke a 430-year silence. After Malachi, there was no word of the Lord. There was nothing. There was just silence. And then John was the one who broke that silence when he cried out in the wilderness, said, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, he, this whole thing about... Um, he is great, but he who is the least in the kingdom is greater. That speaks of humility. You know, John was passionate. John was on fire. But there was a humility that came through him as well. But I love this saying where it says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied to John. That if you replace the word John with grace, which is what John means, it says all the prophets and the law prophesied until grace. <laughs> That's crazy. Because when Jesus came, grace came. Amen? In bodily form. And so every, everyone that was prophesying before was prophesying, you know, but was prophesying under the law. But then when John came, that was the dispensation of grace because he prepared the way for Jesus. And John says grace and truth came in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, isn't that amazing? I love that. For all the prophets and the law. The law was prophesying until John came. <laughs> isn't that amazing? For all, let me read it to you in, in verse 13 and replace John's word with what it means. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until grace. <laughs> That's why he, he was the greatest, because he ushered in 
grace. He ushered in the dispensation of grace. You know, grace, grace had never gone by the way. Grace was always there. But the law came in for a purpose. But then that finished when Jesus came and John actually prepared the way for that. He prepared the way for grace. What an amazing thing. And then we'll finish with this. And, um, because John also had an understanding of the bridegroom and the bride. Do you know that? He had an understanding of that. And so in John 3, 25 to 36, we're going to finish on, on this. Actually, no, we'll just go to verse 30. It says, Then arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified? Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. And John answered and said to him, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear, um, bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. What an amazing thing. <laughs> John's talking about it. Before, be, beforehand, just as Jesus is coming on the scene, he's talking about the bride and the bridegroom. He said, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, the, this joy of mine is fulfilled. And then the, one of the most um, best words in the whole of the Bible, he must increase that I might decrease. I tell you what, if everyone, every Christian on this planet could just get those words, he must increase and I must decrease. That's what Paul was saying. Our flesh is but filthy rags, you know. I need to get, one of the biggest problems that I have to Jesus is that I get in his way. <laughs> the more that I decrease, the more he increases. But I love this. I love where John says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. They were coming to him almost like it was a competitive thing. He goes, you're the one who introduced this guy. You were the original guy. You were the one doing the baptisms. You're the one who said, now he's doing the baptisms and they're going to him. What do you think of that? It's like there was some competition. And he goes, no competition, guys. He's, he's, the, he's the bridegroom of the bride. I'm actually rejoicing that I'm a friend of the bridegroom. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I'd never really seen that before until I studied it. But then John had an amazing understanding way back then of the bridegroom and the bride. So in summary, the, the um, forerunner, John, John was the forerunner to Jesus' first coming. We are now the forerunner of Christ and also to usher in his second coming. Jesus lives and operates outside of time. I find that revelation so empowering. You know, it's so, it's so comforting. You know, people say to me, where's this all going to end? Everything that's all gonna, happening, where's it going to end? I know where it's going to end. It's going to end in Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Amen? And none of this has taken him by surprise because he's already there. He's in your past, he's in your present, and in your future, all at the same time. And that is so comforting to me, because that is the Jesus who I worship. That is the Jesus who I trust in. That is the Jesus who, my friend, who is already in my future, already there. <laughs> it's not like, oh, well, he can tell me what it's going to look like. No, he's there right now. He knows what's, what I'm going to be doing in 10 years' time. So I can trust in him. I can trust in him to guide me, because he already knows what that looks like. Amen? And understanding that concept will actually help you with your trust in, in Jesus and letting him guide you and actually just feeling, you know, I don't need to worry about the future because God already knows what that looks like and it's absolutely glorious and it's far better than I could even ask or think. That's why he doesn't give me the details because I would get in his way. <laughs> I need to decrease that he might increase. If I want to increase and know what's going on, I'll just stuff it all up. Amen? <laughs> yeah. And so um, I love the fact that he lives outside of time. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a, that was a crossing over from, the, from law to grace. Be a light bearer, shine and boon for Jesus. He must increase, we might, must decrease. He is the bridegroom coming back.
for his bride. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for, for John, Lord God, and being true to what you'd called him to do, Lord, and prepare the way for you. And now we've been called to prepare the way. He knew about you to come, but we have you dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. It's such a wonderful thing. And Lord God, just help us to shine that light for you in a dark place, to live true to the calling that you have for us, to live true to you, to trust you, Lord God, because you live outside of time and you've given us a message system that's outside of time. And we thank you for that. Just pray everyone today will leave this place totally encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.